بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه من ولاه أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We are discussing um, conversations, hellfire with themselves. So here's a really interesting one that you may not have thought about it, but it actually comes up in this in this category, and that is conversations with the people of hellfire with their body parts. Conversations of the people of hellfire with their body parts. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually teaching us when a person commits a sin, their own body parts are going to testify against them. So with, ever, with whatever body part that the person is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's suppose that a person is seeing something haram. The eyes are going to speak on the day of judgment, saying that, Oh Allah, with me, he saw such and such. And a person may eat haram And the tongue and the stomach They will testify Oh Allah He committed haram The own body parts So the person They won't be able to stop the body parts Until the body parts start testifying And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says يَوْمَ تَشْهَدُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَلْسِنَتُهُمْ وَأَيْدِيهِمْ شَهِدَ عَلَيْهِمْ There's other verses as well And so the person after the testification happens Because now if you're in a, in a uh, a court case and someone's testifying against you you'd say ya rabbi oh they're not telling the truth oh there's another opinion there's another side to it and so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's actually said to the person kafa bi nafsika alayhi that you yourself suffice as a witness against yourself that you are like the worst witness against yourself or the um, and so on so not the other witnesses the other witnesses are there too but even the person themselves their body parts will testify against them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So actually when you're, when you're disobeying, it's interesting, your body parts aren't on your side. They're not on your side. It's either, you know, so you're like, you know, you're doing haram with your hands, or your face, your eyes, and so on and so forth. Your whole body part's like, okay, it's being recorded, and they will testify against you and against I. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about when the people of hellfire, when they see hellfire, um, Allah Azza says in Surah Al-Fajr, وَجِيءَ يَوْمَئِذٍ بِجَهَنَّمْ So hellfire is brought, right? It's dragged with 70,000 angels, 70,000 like um, chains, with, with each of those chains is being dragged by 70,000 angels. Gatekeepers of hellfire. وَجِيءَ يَوْمَئِذٍ بِجَهَنَّمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانِ Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says يَوْمَئِذٍ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانُ وَأَنَّا لَهُ الذِّكْرَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says On that day, the human being will remember وَأَنَّا لَهُ الذِّكْرَى Like, you know, what's, what's the remembrance going to benefit him now? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي قَدَّمْتُ لِحَيَاتِي They say at that point, when they see hellfire, I wish I had prepared for my life. Right? Prepared for my life that this is where the real life is. And I actually tell these, um, when you're talking about success, if you truly are wondering, you know, how to not mess up your life, you know how everybody's like, what career should I study? Should I follow my art desires even though there's no money involved or should I become an engineer, become a doctor what should I do, let me tell you the one career that if you become this career, there's never going to be any sadness you know what career that is? it's the career of the muttaqin if you're a career muttaqi, this is your job in life is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it doesn't matter what you do it doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter who you married. If you go to Jannah, you were successful. And everything in life, alhamdulillah. 
And now, if you don't take being one of the muttaqin as your career path, then there's no possible way you could ever have happiness. No possible way. In the end, you would hate everybody and everybody that came in contact with you would hate all of them. All these verses that we're saying, these are all people that used to be friends in the dunya. Everything that misguided them from the path, they had done this and they had done that, but in the end it led them to hellfire. And so, taking the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as your path. Now when we say worship of Allah, it doesn't mean that you seclude yourself to the masjid. Again, that's maybe a misunderstanding of the word worship. The word worship, worshiping Allah is everything that Allah is happy and is pleased with. So that includes a career where you're providing for your family and you're benefiting people and so on. That becomes a ibadah when your intention is correct and you're doing right, uh, good actions. Right? And it's having good thoughts and making dua from Muhammad al-Sharif in his absence. All of that stuff. It's all included inshallah ta'ala. <coughs> In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا أُلْقُوا مِنْهَا مَكَانًا ضَيِّقًا مُقَرَّنِينَ دَعَوْ هُنَالِكَ ثُبُورًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when they, when they get into this tight, um, this tight location, another verse actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نَطَّرُّهُ That it becomes a necessity for them to go to hellfire. Meaning that there's no other way there's no other direction. It's almost like you're on a ledge and something's pushing you. There's no direction that you can go except into hellfire. I was actually in a masjid once and I heard the shrill cry of a child. You know, sometimes children cry, but sometimes really cry. And this child cried so, like, um, in such a shrill that it gave me goosebumps and, and I started crying. It reminded me of the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in uh, the verse it's in Surah Al-Qari'ah فَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَقْوَلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةً رَاضِيَةً وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ And as for the person whose scale is light فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَةً that for the person, they're in so much fear. When you're in your ultimate fear, the only safety that you have is running to your mother. That's like the only person that loves you. At that point, like the mother's love. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for the person who comes on the day of resurrection and their mawazin is light, their mother is hellfire. That's in, and that's why I said when that child cried like that, the only th the reason I was saying that it gave me goosebumps is because the only person that could calm that child down is their mother. And I remember the people of Hellfire, may Allah protect you and protect me from being amongst them, that when they cry like that, their mother is Hellfire. As it says in the verse, Wala Sadiqan Hamim, there's nobody, there is nobody that cares about that has no feelings for them when they're in Hellfire. It's interesting this verse again, just kind of like a side point as well. If I said to you arbitrarily that if someone comes on the day of judgment and their scales are heavy, where would they be? In Jannah or in Hellfire? Now, typically, if I didn't tell you the verses before, you would have assumed that they would be in Hellfire. That's just the assumption. Someone comes on and they have heavy, they have heavy. Where are they going? They're going to Jannah. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about good deeds. A lot of people focus on avoiding bad deeds, right? Which is, you know, negation. And there's, there's, you get, you know, a reward for that. But how many people focus on actively accumulating good deeds? How many people skip the sunnah prayers? How many people, when there's Quran time, they try running away? Nobody, like, rarely do you see people actively seeking out those good deeds. How many people, when there's some litter in the message or something, they're like, I didn't do that. I, it's not my problem. Correct? Instead of, as one of our Islam school teachers say, it's an opportunity, to, it's like free reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You just grab it and I'm like, I'll be the first one to throw it in the garbage. I'll be the first one. And this is the examples of the companions of Abu Bakr. The Prophet وسلم, said, Man asbaha. Notice in the words, he said, Who woke up this morning? It's in the morning time. Man asbaha minkum al Who woke up this morning fasting? 
And Abu Bakr said, I did, Ya Rasulullah. And he said, Man zara minkum al yawma maridha. Who has visited a sick person? It's morning time. You're talking about by the time people go to work, Abu Bakr's already done this. He's already visited someone in the hospital. Abu Bakr said, I did. He said, Man ata'ama minkum al yawma miskina. Who's fed a needy person today? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, I did. We were talking about feeding the needy people, right? We were saying, like, go downtown, late night, once in your life, and feed people. This is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's consistent habit. He wakes up in the morning, and he goes and feeds needy people. This is everyday habit. Man atba'a minkum al janaza. Who followed a funeral prayer today? And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, I did. So it's a morning janaza. Right, when they do the janazah, they do it in the afternoon so that more people can come. Because if it's in the morning, rarely will people come for those morning janazahs. Abu Bakr did all of this by the time you're waking up and eating breakfast. By the time you're waking up and eating breakfast, Abu Bakr has already visited a sixth person, fed someone, he's fasting, and he's followed the janazah prayer. And the Prophet said what to him? He said that these four things... It's um, if they ever join together in one person in one day, they will be a person of Jannah. And now, whenever now this is kind of like you know the, the cool thing that the youth are you know whenever there's a janazah going on in the community, there will be like code four. Like there's a janazah prayer, you know, go feed someone, go visit a sick person, and uh, and fast. So there's that you hear get an email, someone passed away. Uh, janazah will be tomorrow at so and so You send an email to everybody You need to fast today And inshallah ta'ala After the janazah will go to the hospital Visit people, sick people It's actually difficult to find people to feed <laughs> If you go to university I'm sure you find lots of like hungry students Inshallah ta'ala But subhanAllah When you actually start thinking about it, Who am I going to feed? Who am I going to visit the sick person? The reason it's difficult for us Is because it's not our consistent habit Right? If it's your consistent habit, there's like, for example, there will be people in the community that know every poor person in the community. They'll be like, go talk to so-and-so, and they have like 70 families that need money. How does this person know 70 families? Because it is their habit, and it is their consistent habit, to follow up on people who need money. And there is community members like that. You just have to find the person who can link you to the other people, inshallah ta'ala. And so we've been speaking about a lot of uh, the things about hellfire, so we'll speak about some conversations in Jannah, inshallah ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, give glad tidings, give good news to those who believe. Have you believed? Have you believed? You better say yeah. <laughs> right? Have you believed? Yes. Okay. Are you doing good deed right now? Are you unsure if it's a good deed or not? <laughs> Inshallah ta'ala, it's a good deed. So I give you glad tidings. I give you good news. It's like here's the headline of this newspaper. Here's the good news that you will have Jannat in Tajreem in Tahtiha al Anhar. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reserved for people who do what you're doing. And inshallah ta'ala you're seeing like from these verses All these conversations You're hoping to be amongst the people of Jannah Every time you see those verses of hellfire You're like I don't want to ever say that I'm learning it now so that I'll never say it In reality And that is in, the, in Jannah So I'm giving you the glad tidings Giving you the good news كُلَّمَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now speaking about Jannah This is Surah Al-Baqarah كُلَّمَا رُزِقُوا مِنْهَا مِنْ ثَمَرَةِ الرِّزْقًا قَالُوا هَذَا الَّذِي رُزِقُنَا مِنْ قَبْلُ وَأُتُوا بِهِ مُتَشَابِهًا وَلَهُمْ فِيهَا أَزْوَاجٌ مُطَهَّرَةٌ وَهُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ In this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually um, there's uh, some, some sisters who did a halaqa very similar to this. They shared their notes with me. So I'm kind of like cheating here. I'm bringing in their notes. And, and I'm adding this verse. This is from their notes. Jazamullah khairan. If you'd like to help me prepare upcoming halaqas, usually I give chances for people. I just put it up on my blog. And like all these different students of knowledge from around the world are preparing the halaqas. I do my own research as well. It's not just them. Um, but it was an interesting point. They say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the people of Jannah. 
كُلَّمَا رُزِقُوا مِنْهَا مِنْ ثَمَرَاتِ الرِّزْقَ Every time the thamarat, these fruits and you know the, the food of Jannah is brought to them, they say, هَذَا الَّذِي رُزِقْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِ They say that this is um, similar to the food that was given to us aforetime. Meaning they recognize the food in Jannah. It looks similar. And this is actually something interesting. I'm trying to think to myself, a food that looks weird. Whose food looks weird? I would say Thai. You know Thai food, Thailand? If you Thai, or do you agree with that? I, I, I went one time to a Thai restaurant and it was like, what is this? It's like cashews or something. You know, what is this? You, know, you can't even describe what that is. Right? So you, now, you look at all this food, it looks weird to you. So what does that do to your internally? You're like, do you have like hamburgers? Do you have something that I recognize? Or something that even looks like something that I recognize? Right? They're like, no, no, try it, it tastes good, but you don't even want to try it, correct? So even from in Jannah, if it was like food that just like, you know, let's say like something like an octopus type of thing, you're like, I've never eaten that in my life. You know, I don't know, but you eat it like, yeah, it's pretty good. But no, even the seeing of the food, it reminds the person of the things that they love the most, right? And then in Jannah, when they eat it, but the taste is different. When they eat it, yes, kind of like the sight is something maybe similar, but then when they eat it, as uh, one of our teachers actually said that when you get hungry, the first food that you eat is like the most delicious, right? You go to a restaurant, they'll say, you know, the food will be out, here's some garlic bread. What's the thing you remember most? The garlic bread. Forget the other, you know, it's like you could actually leave. The garlic bread was free. You'd go out and you're like, okay, I don't need to eat anymore. That, I mean, like, that was the best part. Because it was the part that you ate when you were hungry. The part, you know, the best part of the meal in their terms comes when you're full. After you've eaten the soup and the salad and the garlic bread and, and all the appetizers, and then they bring you the meal and you're like, oh, I'm stuffed, I'm stuffed. Okay, and now you're only, you're suffering, even though this is the meal that you actually came for. In Jannah, that doesn't happen. So in Jannah, the, the desire that you have for the beginning of the food is the same desire that you carry all throughout all the food that you eat. And then the same food that you eat, sometimes you eat something and you've eaten it and now the, the flavor of it, it becomes familiar to you. So if you eat the same food every single day, you're like, okay, another steak, okay, another this. It's the same food, a biryani again. You know, it's the same spices, it's the same, you know, you're just eating the same, the food is familiar, you might like it, but it's still the same thing. In Jannah, it might look the same, but every time you eat it, it has a new flavor to it. And so each time you're eating the food, you're, you know, you're looking forward to the new flavors that are going to be coming from the food. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the people of Jannah. I mean. Okay, now the conversations of the people of Hellfire with Allah and the people of uh, of Jannah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So I'm going to set this up I'm going to mention the people of hellfire And And then enough of that <laughs> Then we will speak about the people of Jannah inshallah ta'ala So we will end with the people of, of Jannah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us SubhanAllah even like listening to their whining Listening to their you know send us back and this and that Excuses like that's SubhanAllah excuses is a characteristic of the people of hellfire. Write that one down. People of Jannah don't make excuses. You never see someone in Jannah and say, and say, Oh, I regret. Oh, I wish I had done this. Oh, I didn't have time to do that. They're not like that. They're saying, Alhamdulillah, that we did this. They're people of action. And the people of hellfire are people of excuses. Even in this dunya, if you see people who have achieved great things in, in, their, in, this, in the dunya sense, businesses and you know whatever, they don't make excuses. You never sit them saying, oh, you know what, the reason we didn't achieve this was such and that. Those are like subordinates that don't get results. The people that get results are the people who don't live in excuses. And so of the verses, they say, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not responding to them, there are statements that are said to them, but Allahu alam, even the mercy of Allah speaking to them, doesn't, they don't get that. Right? So they say, رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا نَعْمَلُ صَالِحًا غَيْرَ الَّذِي كُنَّا نَعْمَلُ They say, رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا O oh, our Lord, send us or take us out. نَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا We're going to do good. In another verse they'll say, 
وقالوا لو كنا نسمع أو نعقل ما كنا في أصحاب السعير They said if only we used to hear or if only we had a brain نعقل If only we, ha- we actually executed our intelligence We wouldn't be in this uh, punishment uh, أصحاب السعير In another verse they'll say يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا أَمَتَّنَا اثْنَتَيْنِ وَأَحْيَيْتَنَا اثْنَتَيْنِ In this verse يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا أَمَتَّنَا اثْنَتَيْنِ وَأَحْيَيْتَنَا اثْنَتَيْنِ فَاعْتَرَفْنَا بِذُنُوبِنَا فَاعْتَرَفْنَا بِذُنُوبِنَا فَهَلْ إِلَى خُرُوجٍ مِّن سَبِيلٍ This verse still saying, Our Lord, Amatana Thnatain, you've um twice you've made us without life and twice you've given us late uh, life. So we admit our sins. Right? They lived in their arrogance, they lived knowing that these verses existed. They say, We now admit our sins. Is there any possibly any possible way that we can get out? Any way? Can you hook us up? Can you like send us back? They're not even asking to go to Jannah, in fact. They're just saying, give us another chance to go back to the dunya so that we could be in the position of all of you who are listening. Just give us a chance to be in this position where we're hearing your words and we're believing in it and we're actually acting upon it. <clears throat> in another verse, they'll say, قَالُوا رَبَّنَا غَلَبَتْ عَلَيْنَا شِقْوَتُنَا وَكُنَّا قَوْمًا ضَالِّينَ رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا فَإِنْ عُدْنَا فَإِنَّا ظَالِمُونَ They'll say, قَالُوا رَبَّنَا غَلَبَتْ عَلَيْنَا شِقْوَتُنَا Misfortune has overwhelmed us. وَكُنَّا قَوْمٌ ضَالِينَ They're saying, we were misguided people. They're in hellfire and now they're admitting it. Right? They're like, great misfortune has befallen us. وَكُنَّا قَوْمٌ ضَالِينَ We're misguided. Okay, you know, congratulations for coming to that conclusion now. Right? And then they say, رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا فَإِنُّ عُدْنَا فَإِنَّا ظَالِمُونَ They say, O oh, our Lord, send us out, like take us out of hellfire, and um, you know, take us back to the dunya, فَإِنُّ عُدْنَا If we do the same sins, then we're really, we're really criminals. And again, it's, it's said to them, قَالَ أَخْسَأُوا فِيهَا وَلَا تُكَلِّمُونَ Be disgraced in hellfire and don't talk. Like we said, this is the beginning. This is when they actually had hope in calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is the beginning. And then it goes down and down and down to the point where they've lost hope. Even of, you know, the, the option of coming out of hellfire, forget that. The option of hellfire, of them getting any water, forget that. The option of the punishment being shut off for a part of the time, forget that. Of any rest whatsoever, forget that. The option of the punishment being lowered for just a portion of the day, meaning they'll still be in punishment, but just it's like the the um, the punishment is turned down just a little bit for a portion of the day. Forget that. The option of anyone even listening to them, forget that. There's nothing for them. And in hellfire, you start to think, how long are they going to be in hellfire? When we say infinity, you may not understand that. They'll be in hellfire for as long as you're alive right now. How, how old are you now? 30, 50, 70? However age you are, just imagine that they've been in hellfire the whole time. The whole time. Day and night. You've been sleeping half of the 30 years of your life. Half of it was spent sleeping. No, they've been in hellfire. There was no sleep for them. All that time there was no rest, there's no food, there's no water, there's nothing for them. And the hellfire punishment is not just a person touching a simple fire, right? This is hellfire. This is Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And it is said to them, فَذُوقُوا So taste it. فَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِن نصير. So taste it because there is no one to help the criminals. The ظالمون, the transgressors, there's nobody to help them. There's nobody that cares about them, nobody to help them. And the people that seemingly would care, which are those leader figures in the dunya, they're not even there to help them. In fact, they're intensifying them in their punishment, making it an internal regret. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. 
In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَوْمَ يَقُولُ نَادُوا شُرَكَائِيَ الَّذِينَ زَعَمْتُمْ فَدَعَوْهُمْ فَلَمْ يَسْتَجِيبُوا لَهُمْ وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَوْبِقًا وَرَأَى الْمُجْرِمُونَ النَّارَ فَظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ مُوَاقِعُوهَا وَلَمْ يَجِدُوا عَنْهَا مَصْرِفًا in this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَوْمَ يَقُولُ On the day when he will say, نَادُوا شُرَكَائِيَ الَّذِينَ زَعَمْتُمْ Go and call everyone that you used to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with. Go and call them now. Go and call on, on these people. SubhanAllah, you know, it's interesting when, um, when believers are tortured, when it's like someone who's torturing them because they're Muslim, they normally make this statement to them in, in the prison while they're torturing them. They'll, they'll say something like, call your God if he's truthful. That guy's in for a big surprise. <laughs> right? You know, where is your God now? Why doesn't he protect you? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects those believers. And now these people who do torture like that, and the people, the criminals, the, the, the sinful ones, it will be said to them, where are your gods? Who did you used to call other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who's going to help you now? فَلَمْ يَسْتَجِيبُوا لَهُمْ And of course, no one will be responding. And in fact, if they did respond, they would be responding in intensifying the punishment upon these people. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they, the people of hellfire will say, قَالُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّا أَطَعْنَا سَادَتَنَا وَكُبَرَاءَنَا فَأَضَلُّونَ السَّبِيلَا In this verse, their excuse to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, رَبَّنَا إِنَّا أَطَعْنَا سَادَتَنَا Sada, like you'd say to someone like um, Siada or Sidi. We used to follow our, our you know, like our Sadada, Sadatana. I was going to say like Sadat. <laughs> we used to follow our, our leaders and our chiefs. فَأَضَلُّونَ sabila. Oh, our Lord, they misguided us amongst the, the path. Is that, is that a good excuse? <laughs> and yeah, no, they're still in hellfire and it's going to avail them nothing. So the people in hellfire are saying, they're saying to Allah, Oh Allah, give those people two punishments. That's what they're saying. You know, and even that is a mercy for them, knowing that the leaders got double the punishment. And they're not even getting that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qala li kullin Everybody's getting double punishment. The followers and the leaders. And now I thought to myself, um, when it comes to our leaders, do we follow our leaders? And then a lot of people are like rebellious. <laughs> they don't follow leaders and stuff like that. So who are the leaders that people, that people follow? <clears throat> and just so you understand, who are the chiefs? I would say... Um, of, of chiefs that take the status are media chiefs, right? Media chiefs, people who own, uh, you know, media stations and whatnot, and people follow that. They watch TV and they're like, I saw on TV such and such. And so they, they listen to that. Is the TV forcing them to do anything? Obviously not. But the person is misguided by that. They've taken their television set as Khalili, right? Ya laytani lam attakhid fulan and Khalila. Right? They've taken everything that the TV says, the TV said such and such, I saw on TV, and, and whatnot. Even like, you remember, even when we were talking earlier, when someone said, you know, my dog ate my, my, uh, my homework, it's a statement that comes from television. Correct? I'm just, uh, it's not a bad statement, right? Not that we have dogs in our house or anything like that. But I'm just giving you a glimpse of, we are indoctrinated by our television sets. It is indoctrination. So you're getting it. You can't talk back to the TV. The TV says something. The person says a statement of kufr. You can't say anything. And it's just like, while you're in the midst of... Okay, let me leave the, leave the TV. The next one is scientists are chiefs. All hail Darwin. Darwin said that our, my, our granddaddy was a, was a monkey. All right? And so then a person will say, you know, I'll follow the prophet so long as he agrees with Darwin. Or so long as the Qur'an, as, so long as science testifies that the Qur'an is the truth, then we will follow it. And subhanAllah, they, um, and, we're, and believe me, this indoctrination is very deep. 
It's, it's like you're talking about from the deepest level. We have been indoctrinated all throughout our schooling system to not question any, uh, sorry, to question everyone except the teacher that told you that statement. Do you see what I'm saying? Even when you're telling me right now, they're like, are you saying we shouldn't question? I'm telling you to question the teacher who told you don't question it, uh, question everything. That's what I'm telling you to question. After all those years of being taught, question everything, question everything, question everything, we said to the teacher, we will not question what you're saying to us, and we will question everybody else. And then when I was in Medina, and I was, um, I was sitting with the Al-Arba'in al nawiya the 40 Hadith uh, Nawi, and I was like memorizing about the second Hadith, Prophet Sallallahu is talking about the stages of the, um, the creation of the Ibn Adam. Right? 40 days like this, 40 days like this, 40 days like this. The narrator of the hadith made a statement and it just like, it shook me. And it, it like kind of like, it took the indoctrination like snapped it. He said, the narrator says that the Prophet ﷺ said, and before he mentioned what the Prophet ﷺ said, he said, وَهُوَ الصَّادِقُ الْمُصْدُقُ And he made this statement about the Prophet ﷺ. That um, وَهُوَ الصَّادِقُ الْمَصْدُقُ That he is a sadiq. He is the truthful one. Al-Masduq, The one whom the people have accepted as the one sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm saying it shook me because it goes against all of our indoctrination that we question everybody. We've applied that to the Prophet ﷺ. In our ignorance... We went and said, if the Prophet ﷺ said something, we will still question it. And who is the governing person? The scientist is. And if you want to understand the scientists and their confusions, just look at the diet industry. And you will see how much confusion they're in. It's not like one science, and everybody said, this is science that is always in agreement. They're always in disagreement. And you can never, every, and if you're just following the diet scene, every Every, I was, I was going to say every two years, but I changed, every six months, they're changing what is healthy to you. Correct? What was healthy yesterday is not healthy today, and what's healthy tomorrow, what's healthy today is not healthy tomorrow. And even the people that tell you, they say, give us feedback because it will change tomorrow. It'll keep changing and so on. One day they're saying, check your weight. The other say, don't check your weight because it's according to fluctuations and stuff like that. Atmospheric pressures and there's a full moon. Forget the weight. Instead, you know, look at your, you know, BMI. The scientists. Then you have the bosses. The boss. The boss tells you you can't pray Juma. Right? Or the boss, or you know, the friends at work, but now we're talking about the boss. The friends at work might make fun of you, but the boss is now telling you, yeah, you subhanallah, you're praying in public. You're praying in public. I remember once when I was a little kid, this this um, we were going to play like some sports, and another brother came and um, and I and he missed Juma. I'm like, okay, no problem. You go ahead and pray on the side. And I remember seeing his face. He's like, um, I can't pray in front of the non-Muslims. Like, what did you just say? <laughs> okay, so it's like non-Muslims. What are they going to do? Okay, la, 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 worst case scenario, the non-Muslim is drunk. They're going to take a beer bottle and smash it on your head. That's like worst case scenario, okay? That they're actually going to do some physical harm. Are they going to do that to you? No, obviously they're not going to do that to you. What's the worst they're going to do? What's the worst they're going to do? They're going to laugh. Okay, probably that's the worst they will do. Right? They'll sit there and they'll like, what's he doing? Ha, 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 ha. Do you even know, like, while you're praying, you don't even know who those people are. Right? You're not like staring at them like, you know, are they looking at me and stuff like that. You're not, you don't even care. It's internal in your mind. You don't want to get criticisms from people. This is the nature of the human being. So this is what you do. Next time you're praying and stuff at Salah time, this is what you do. In your mind, you say to yourself, visual da'wah. Allah Akbar. Just say to yourself, visual da'wah. I am doing da'wah to these people, whether they like it or not. You will see what a Muslim does. And you just start praying. People walk by. And this is, subhanAllah, I, I was at a park and I was praying there. And this guy walked by with his son. And I'm praying. And his son said to, I heard his dad, uh, the son saying to the father, he said, Daddy, what's he doing? And his father said, he's praying. I said, I'm in prayer. I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> like you th we think we're like, 
not all the non-Muslims are like dunces. They don't know what we're doing. They know you're praying. Okay? And it's actually, it's something very honorable. If you didn't know that. Praying to Allah is something very honorable. I'll tell you this one. This is a, this is a cool one. This is after 9-11. Okay? Where, do I, where did I live after 9-11? I was living in Washington, D.C. <laughs> okay, so this is 9-11. We're coming back from a camp. Me and another brother, I'm wearing like a, a thobe, and the brother's wearing like a, a kurta, and the brother's kind of like white-skinned, so he looks like some uh, guy who joined with the Taliban or something like that, right? And, and on the highway, they were like, report suspicious activity call, you know, <laughs> the, the cops and so on and so forth. Do we look suspicious? Obviously, right? If you're Muslim and you have a beard, you look suspicious. So they're going to report you. So it's a lot of time and we're at this rest stop. And the rest stop, it's not like Canadian rest stops. It's like, it's really busy, right? And it's like both directions, like all here. And we need to pray. So we went a little away. And you can tell kind of like, you know, um, SUVs with, you know, tinted glass kind of like looking at us. <laughs> you could tell that. And then um, we went into, a, into this bush and we're away from the rest stop. <laughs> we're like, Allah Akbar. At that point, about 36 cars surrounded us. <laughs> okay? I'm talking about 36, every, like, you know, all the undercover cops, all the regular, all the state troopers, all that, they surrounded us. And they're like, get up, get up, what are you doing, what are you doing, right? And it's the end of the, the prayer, I'm like, man, if I break my prayer now, we have to pray again. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm like, you know what, and, and they're still shouting at us to get up and so on and so forth, but I'm like, quickly, you know, I had to last not to tell you. Okay, I, I did my prayer. The other brother had to break his prayer. And then they escorted the other brother, where's your ID, where is this and that? On the, um, on the report, they're like, what are you doing here? We're praying. On the report, they said, two Muslim men praying in a bush. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Um, and then, and then I told the officer, I said, is it okay if we like finish our prayer and stuff like that? He's like, yeah, no problem. He's <laughs> like, pray for me. <laughs> right? So it's visual da'wah. Obviously, sometimes you'll scare people when you pray. Did I scare you guys? Doesn't have, this is Washington, D.C. If you pray in Ottawa, the people looking at you are Muslim. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so if it's a security guy, he's Muslim. If it's a worker taking a smoke, they're still Muslim. And after you finish prayer, they're going to say assalamu alaikum to you. Or they'll actually turn you in the direction of the qibla. Right? <laughs> so don't worry about praying, inshallah. Ta'ala, you might be remind someone. Okay, so the sad that it could be the bosses, a boss telling a person, no, you can't pray Jamar, or, you know, no, sister, you can't wear your headscarf, your hijab, and, and work, and so on and so forth. You can't uh, follow that. Alhamdulillah, we live in a country where you actually can bring up these issues and, and sue them, and, and so on and so forth, for, for doing such things. And then you have, like, politicians. Politicians that are steering things. Obviously, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there's like chiefs and tribal leaders that would lead. We don't have like tribes, but some of you might from come from cultures where there's like a tribal uh, atmosphere to your family, and then there might be a head to that tribe um, taking people in this direction or that direction, or even boycotting you if you don't follow what they say. Another interesting point, very interesting, is that hellfire speaks with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Okay, so we spoke about interesting thing that we discovered was hellfire speaking, um, sorry, not hellfire, but a person speaking with their own body parts, correct? And now, actually, hellfire speaks with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where Allah azza wa jal says, يَوْمَ نَقُولُ لِجَهَنَّمَ هَلِمْ تَلَأْتِ وَتَقُولُ هَلْ مِمْ مَزِيدٍ Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on the day when we say to hellfire, have you, um, have you become full? And hellfire will say back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, هَلْ مِنْ مَزِيدٍ Is there any more? And so this is a conversation, actually this is coming where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to hellfire, have you become full? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made, made a promise that he would fill hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَكِنْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ مِنِّي لَأَمْلَأَنَّ جَهَنَّمَ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ وَلَكِنْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the truthful word from me لَأَمْلَأَنَّ That I am going to fill hellfire with uh, the jinn and mankind like completely. Hellfire will be full.
And in this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they enter hellfire and then they say, Rabbana, that, O oh our Lord, give us, yeah, give those people who misguided us double the punishment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِكُلِّ ضِعْفِ Both of them will have that punishment. All right. The people of Jannah. And now we take it, the last leg home, inshallah ta'ala. Hopefully, inshallah, may Allah make you, when that wall goes up, and you're separated forever and ever from kuffar and munafiqeen, that you'll be on the side of the delegation going to Jannah. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you and make me from amongst those people. We have no other choice. This is the only thing that we can aim for. So conversations of people of Jannah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the most beautiful verses that I love to mention again and again, and I, even I was thinking today, you know, as I read this and was preparing this, I thought to myself, why does this story... Why, I, I mention this one like almost in every second lecture. I'm like, why does it mean so much to me? And I'll tell you, after I tell you the verse. It is the conversation of Asiya, alayhi salam, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is when Fir'aun uh, heard that she had become a believer, who could help her in this dunya? Nobody could help her except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She knew that nobody could stand up to Fir'aun. The fear that Fir'aun, and we talked about this in the parish nation, nobody could stand up um, to the fear that Fir'aun was putting into the people. Musa alayhi salam, of course, but here in, um, in the home of Fir'aun, to show you what kind of a maniac he is, He's not beating his wife, he's torturing his wife. This is his wife, and he's torturing her. Like he tells the guards, take her and torture her. And, in, and this is not just a torture where you know she's released after a while. It's torture that takes her till death, till shahada. And so she says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in these verses, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا امْرَأَةَ فِرْعَوْنَ إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ بْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ Where Asiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا Allah makes an example for the believers, Imra'ata Fir'aun, the woman of Fir'aun. إِذْ قَالَتْ When she said. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like, some people, they make dua that's so beautiful. You know, sometimes you'll hear someone. There's actually, in, in Hajj time, one of the shaykh was telling me, he goes, there was this person making dua, that he said, even as he's making dua, and he's like shaking, he's like, he's shaking the shaykh's body. And the shaykh is like, sometimes you just get mesmer. The dua is so beautiful. You know what I'm talking about. There's like these duas that are like so beautiful. And, and you love listening to them. And this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved listening to it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recorded it in the Quran so that we would read it. Hopefully that we would take lesson from her dua. That Allah loved her so much and loved what she said so much that he made it an example for everybody. وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مُرَأَةَ فِرْعَوْنَ إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ بْنِي لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ She's in this torture and she's saying, Oh Allah, build for me a home near you in Jannah. وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ Save me from Fir'aun and his actions. وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ And save me from the tyrant people. From Fir'aun and then save me from his henchmen. Now, what's interesting, and I actually wrote it down so I, so I wouldn't forget. In her dua, and I realized at this point that this is a characteristic of the people of Jannah. They seek companionship before they even seek the dwelling. It's actually, um, it's, a, it's like a statement in, in Arabic. It's kind of like a one of those like words of wisdom, al jiwar qabl al-dar, which is you first look at your neighbors before you buy a house, right? So if you were, for example, if you were going to buy a house, don't look at the house and the size, you're asking, who are my neighbors? Because if you get this nice house and then you have a neighbor, there's 25 guys living there and they have parties every night and they drink alcohol and they sleep on their streets, you know, and they're drunk all night long, 
who cares what the house is? You're like in a living hell, correct? So what you would do actually is you would go, when you arrive, go to the neighbors and say, if, if there's something that you regret about living here, what would it be? That's a very interesting question to ask your neighbors. And they'll say, you know what, at 3 o'clock there's a school just right behind that tree, you can't see it, but the kids come out and they make the biggest noise. I wish I had lived somewhere else. Or there is like a masjid down the road when it's tarawih time, Ramadan, like, you know, God help you, you got to park like 30 minutes away. You don't want to live here. <laughs> and so on. Who are the neighbors? There's actually an interesting point there. I'm going like, like five tangents down, right? Confusing you. You want to be the best neighbors so that the neighbors, Muslims or non-Muslims that are living near the masjid, they would be like, we're actually going to charge you more because it's near to the masjid. And the Muslims are so good to us, right? They're always giving us food, they're always taking care of us, they're mowing our lawns, they're cleaning the snow, they're all doing all these things. I wouldn't leave here for anything. How many people, I mean, that's almost like a joke when I say that, right? Because they're, actually when the, Muslim, when the masjid comes in the area, probably the value of the properties go down. goes down after that. The reason I say that she's saying in her dua, Rabbi binili indaka baytan fil jannah. Oh, oh my Lord, build me a home near you in Jannah. So she wants to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It reminded me of the hadith where the companion said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, ask whatever you want. And the, and the companion said, marafaqatuka fil jannah. Your companionship being with you in Jannah is what I seek. Right? So it's like being with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in Jannatul Firdaus. We have the conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the last person to escape from hellfire. So the last person, after you know, believers are coming out of hellfire, we said either um, they're doing tawbah in this dunya or in the hereafter, Allah forgive them, or they go to hellfire. People who believe in La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, they might still go to hellfire and the hellfire would purify them so that the last of those you know, um, Muslims comes out and then uh, uh, it's a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said that this person will come out and you know, like he thinks that he's been given the greatest gift in the world, the fact that he's escaped from hellfire. That is like the greatest success, escape from hellfire. And then the hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like creates a tree for him and now he's come from hellfire. And, you know, this is the greatest gift. But then he sees the tree and then, you know, there's shade there, there's water there. And he's like, oh Allah, you know, uh, you know grant me the, um, the shade of this tree. You know, this companionship, being with this tree. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants it to him. And then after Allah gives him that tree, then another tree, bigger than that tree, is, is, is there. And he's like, oh Allah, give me that tree. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him that tree. Until, you know, and then there's a bigger tree, oh Allah, give me that tree. And then he sees the gates of Jannah. Oh Allah, let me go and live just by the gates of Jannah. I won't ask you for anything else. And then he gets to, Allah gives him permission to um, be on the outskirts of Jannah. He's just outside. This is like the greatest gift. But then the doors, are, you know, he sees inside what's going on in Jannah. And he's like, Ya Rabbi, let me just enter into Jannah. And I won't ask anything else. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, it's a hadith Qudsi, he said, is there, you know, how can I, um, what will like, you know, uh, stop you from consistently asking me for, for things? What will like suffice you? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, What if I was to give you Jannah, sorry, the, the dunya and all the blessings in it, right? The, you know, the re a reward of this life and everything in it, and all the, all the virtues of this life, وَمِثْلَهُ مَعَ وَمِثْلَهُ مَعَ وَمِثْلَهُ مَعَ up to ten times. Like the dunya and everything in it, all the happiness and all the joy of the dunya, uh, times ten. Again and again and again and again and again and again, ten times. And then this person, the last person from hellfire, he says to Allah, he's like, are you mocking me? <laughs> and the companion, radiallahu anhu, is narrating the hadith, he smiled and he's like, ask me why I'm smiling. And then they said, why are you smiling? He said, because the Prophet ﷺ smiled. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he narrated this hadith, he said to, to the companion, he said, ask me why I'm smiling. And the companion said, why are you smiling, Ya Rasulullah? And he said, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala smiled at the statement of his slave. Are you mocking me? Like, is this a joke? 
some sort of joke that I get like the dunya and everything in it like times 10. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, says to him, لا ولكني على ما أشاء قدير. But rather I have the power to do anything that I wish. And this is the last person to enter Jannah. So that, that's the last person entering Jannah. And he gets the dunya and everything in it times 10. Remember I was telling you, anytime you go to a beautiful place, in this dunya, you just imagine how amazing would it be to be able to live here forever, to be financially free and have no sickness and the best companionship and be able, you know, if it was only this, would you be happy? And you'd be like, yes, I'd be happy. And the dunya is um, something, it's like just a droplet of water from the ocean compared to what's in the hereafter. In Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ said that when the affair has been decreed, Right? All the people who enter Jannah, they enter Jannah, all the people who enter Hellfire, enter Hellfire. It will be said, Ya Ahl al Jannah, O people of Jannah, Hal ta'arifuna hadha. There will be like a sheep coming and brought, and it says, Do you know what this is? And the people of Jannah will say, Yes, we know what it is. This is death. And then it will be said to the people of Hellfire, Do you know what this is? And the people of Hellfire will say, Yes, this is death. Hadha al maut. And then it will be commanded and the sheep will be slaughtered. It will be as if it's like a sheep. It will be slaughtered. And then it will say, Ya Ahl al Jannah, Khuludun fala maut. Wa Ya Ahl al Nar, Khuludun fala maut. It will be said to the people of Jannah, O oh people of Jannah, eternity, there, will be no, there is no more death. And it will be said to the people of Hellfire, eternity, there is no more death. And so death will be slaughtered. And so for the people of Jannah, they've seen death slaughtered. They will never die. And this is the intensification of the beauty that they're in. If you're afraid that one day, subhanAllah, that's interesting, the people of the dunya, you'd think that someone who has a billion dollars, for example, would they be happy? No, they're actually scared. What are they scared about? They're scared that they're going to lose it one day. Or they're scared that the government's going to come and take it away from them, which they do, <laughs> right? Which is a valid concern. They're afraid that it will, they will, it will be lost one day. In Jannah, Jannah will never be lost. Once the people have entered Jannah, it's um, that happiness for all of eternity. SubhanAllah, it makes you feel like saying Alhamdulillah from now, right? Like Alhamdulillah that something is of that is waiting for you, inshaAllah ta'ala, for those who believe and do righteous deed. Now, we're getting closer. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said مَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا سَيُكَلِّمُهُ رَبُّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهُ تُرْجُمَانٌ Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there's not a single one of you except that they're going to speak to Allah that um, there's nothing be- there's no translator between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the hisab the person is going to look on their right and they're not going to see anything except that which they had prepared for this day. And they're going to look on their left and they're not going to see anything except that which they had prepared for this day. And so the Prophet wasallam said, and in front of them they're going to see hellfire. And so the Prophet wasallam concluding said, فَاتَّقُوا النَّارِ وَلَوْ بِشَقِّ تَمْرَةِ He said, protect yourself and save yourself from hellfire even if it's with half a date. And this is actually the hadith you'll actually um, hear mentioned in the, um, in the fundraisers. Correct? You're like, even if it's half a date. And usually I know like the, the khatibs when they say that, you know, dear brothers and sisters, we need more than a half a date today. We need to raise, you know, I don't know, $500,000 or something like that. But don't belittle half the date. I know I'm saying that that's usually where I hear that statement that, oh, we need more than half a date. But from the person's perspective, sometimes person's giving sadaqah, oh, I don't have a thousand dollars to give, so I'm not going to give. No, what do you have? I have change in my pocket. Put it. Whatever you have. Even if, it, if it's with half a date, on that day, you're going to wish that you put that 25 cents in the box. Anything that you wish that you could put between you and, and hellfire. And so the Prophet is saying, even if you, your only possession is a date, even dates, subhanAllah, you look in Ramadan time, nobody eats the dates. 
They want to eat like the ice cream or they want to eat the samosas and so on and so forth. It's like, you know, there's so many days, it piles up and it's like from last Ramadan. If your only possession was one date and there was a, a need for that date, you take the date, you'd break it in half and you give half of it sadaqah. You give half of it sadaqah. Why are you giving it? Are you giving it so someone says thank you to you? No. Are you giving it because you're hoping for something in return, your wife's going to be nice to you or something like that? No. Why are you giving it? Because you fear the day when you're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a critical, it's a change of uh, a mindset for the people of Jannah. When they do their righteous deeds, they're not doing it to get thanks from people. They're not doing it to get compensation. They're doing it because they always remember that day when they're going to be standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and conversing with Allah azza wa No translator and everywhere around them is just going to be their actions and the hellfire is going to be there in front of them. And they're saying that I'm doing this action not to get anything from you, but so that I'll have something between me and between the hellfire. And I actually have good news for you, alhamdulillah. There's not too many people working for Jannah. Actually, it's kind of weird when I said good news. <laughs> it's not really good news. The good news, what I mean is that the gold is just waiting for you. That's what I mean. It's like everywhere. Nobody's picking it up. The front lines in Salah. If you come into the masjid, you want to pray in the front line, nobody will fight you for it. They'll say, please, brother, go ahead. Go ahead. They're sitting on the walls and stuff like that. <laughs> go ahead. Everybody's sitting at the back in Jummah prayer. Come for Jummah prayer. You can walk right. Even if you want to say the event, I want to say the event. Go ahead, brother, please. Give the event. <laughs> if someone becomes Muslim, who will teach him Surah Al-Fatiha? Everybody's like, you know what? I'm busy. I don't have time to get teach this guy Surah Al-Fatiha. You become the person who teaches him. If you taught a new Muslim Surah Al-Fatiha, how many times are they going to read that in their life? Like, you lose track of it. They're going to read Surah Al-Fatiha their whole life. And, inshallah, they'll marry and they'll have Muslim children and they'll teach their children Surah Al-Fatiha. And you have like a legacy of teaching Surah Al-Fatiha. Right? Something so simple. And you all know that. You just sit the person down, let me teach you how to do your salah. And you get rewarded for you know, all their salah. It doesn't take anything away from their reward. Allah gives you an equal reward to that. And so on. You just look at all the sunnahs of the Prophet ﷺ, you will find that you rarely find anybody competing with you. And there's just so much ajr, inshallah ta'ala, waiting for the picking, inshallah. It's just primed. Like the field is full of raspberries. Big, juicy raspberries. You take as many as you want. Alhamdulillah. Which reminds me of another hadith. <laughs> In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He created Jannah, He told Jibreel alayhi salam, go and see Jannah. And Jibreel alayhi salam came back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and said that, uh, came back to Allah azza wa and said that, you know, after seeing Jannah, there's like, He can't imagine anybody that hears about Jannah except that they would work for this Jannah, that they would enter Jannah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, go back and see, you know, the, um, the tests of what leads to Jannah and Jibreel alayhi salam when he saw those things that you know the shahawat, the desires and things that are surrounding Jannah that are actually trying to distract you from Jannah he said I fear that no one would enter Jannah because of those distractions so yes I'm talking about like all these beautiful lush raspberries the whole field is full but there are desires that cloud you from that there are things will come up you know well, I gotta do this I have time I need to go and I, you know, all these things will just come and block the person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, bless you inshallah ta'ala that you would recognize that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَقِيتُ Ibrahim alayhi wa sallam لَيْلَةَ أُسْرِيَ بِيَا فَقَالْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ اِقْرَأْ أُمَّتِكَ مِنِّ السَّلَامِ وَأَخْبِرْهُمْ أَنَّ الْجَنَّةِ طِيبَةٌ التُرْبَ عَذْبَةٌ الْمَاءِ وَأَنَّهَا قَيْعَانٌ وَأَنَّ غِرَاسُهَا سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ وَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ The Prophet ﷺ said that I met Ibrahim ﷺ on the night in which uh, the Isra and Miraj. And he said, Ya Muhammad, give my salam to your ummah. And so we're passing on the salam as well. Ibrahim ﷺ sends his salam to you. <laughs> And the narrators and the Prophet ﷺ passed it on. And then he said, وَأَخْبِرْهُمْ And let them know. This is Ibrahim ﷺ. Let, let you know, your ummah know that Al-Jannah... <laughs> my translation would be that Jannah is nice. <laughs> that would be my translation. Obviously that's not a correct translation. It's طِيبَةٌ تُرْبَةٌ عَذْبَةٌ الْمَاءٌ 
that um, like tiba uh, tiba you could call like tiba uh, is like perfume, right? It's like the musk and beautiful perfume. That is the soil of jannah. That's the soil of jannah. You're like <laughs> you're like taking the soil even and you're loving it. Adbatun al ma the water is pure. It's pure water. Ma'an ghairi asin. Wa anna qay'an. I don't know what the translation of qay'an is. Inshallah ta'ala someone will tell me later. Wa anna gharasuha. Wa anna gharasuha. Gharasuha means like you want to plant a home in Jannah, right? You want to plant those trees you're talking about, the last person to enter Jannah. He's like even the trees outside of Jannah and he wants to live in these trees. The tree planting in Jannah and the home planting. How do you build your home in Jannah? The, the seeds, the seeds that are going to, you know, like when you put the seed in, the seed is, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Those are the seeds of Jannah. How easy is it for, for you to say, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. It is something that, subhanallah, that any time a person will die, they would regret not saying it more. And that your tongue should always be moist with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Anytime someone will say like, oh, I'm bored. <laughs> you're not bored. You have time to say, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. You're in the bus, you're in the subway, you're in, um, you know, waiting in line, you're, um, you're at the border and they're sitting you down for six hours, stuff like that. <laughs> Lots of time. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allah akbar. How many people actually take advantage of that? Are planting seeds in general? It doesn't happen. <clears throat> so subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allah akbar. The reason I'm saying these things, these are like practical things you can move from here forward. We've been talking about Jannah, and I think I want to be Jannah. Obviously, the pillars of Islam, obviously. Um, and these are like simple things that even while you're sitting here, you're going there doing salah on the Prophet and all of these things will build your home for you in Jannah. This is Mu'adh radiallahu anhu asking the Prophet the question that all of you are asking right now. And that is, Mu'adh radiallahu anhu is asking on our behalf, قُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَخْبِرْنِي بِعَمَلٍ يُدْخِلُنِ الْجَنَّةِ وَيُبَاعِدُنِي عَنِ النَّارِ he said, yeah, O Messenger of Allah, Ya Rasulullah, tell me about an action that will enter me into, uh, into Jannah and will distance me from hellfire. Right? Isn't that the question you're asking? Indeed it is. Qala, the Prophet Sallallahu said, لَقَدْ سَأَلْتَ عَنْ عظيم. He said, indeed you've asked for something enormous. It's an enormous question. Right? وَإِنَّهُ يَسِيرٌ عَلَى مَنْ يَسَرَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ he said, it's something enormous, but indeed it's very easy for those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for. And so the Prophet said, this is how you do it. How to get to Jannah and how to stay away from hellfire. Ta'abudullah, la tushrik bihi shay'a. That you worship Allah and you associate no partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa tuqeem as salah And you establish, underline, establish your salah. Establish like your salah is a pillar. If anybody saw your salah, would they go, man, your salah is a pillar? Would they say that about your salah? And for most people, they'd be like, no, my pillar, my salah is like a wavy quirk in the in the water or something like that, right? No, this is like established salah. And this is props for the um, you know the older uncles that come to the masjid. In every masjid, there's a group of uncles that are always there. If you go to the masjid, you know who we're talking about. There are four or five of them that they don't, you know, they might not attend the lecture. Not, they're always there in the masjid. Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, they're always there. They're old, they're always in the masjid. There is a group of people that always do that. Inshallah ta'ala, they're amongst those who establish their salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enter them into Jannah al Firdaus. Wa tuqeem al salah, wa tu'at al zakah, that you give your zakah. Wa tasuma Ramadan, and that you would fast in Ramadan. Wa tahaj al bayt, and that you would do hajj. To the bait, uh, Hajj to the Kaaba. Um, from my experience with zakah, people fast in Ramadan, alhamdulillah. People have the intention to go for Hajj, alhamdulillah. When it comes to zakah, a lot of people um, don't know the fiqh of zakah. And so I would remind you here that this is one of the characteristics of the people that go to Jannah. 
And this is from, they give their zakah, you might actually be surprised when you start learning about zakah that many years may have passed and you haven't paid zakah. And it is fard upon you to learn. Right? Talabul ilm fariza. Seeking knowledge is fard. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, ثُمَّ قَالْ أَلَا أَدُلُّكَ عَلَىٰ أَبْوَابِ الْخَيْرِ the Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'ad. So Mu'ad asked him this question. This will get you into Jannah, what we just said here. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Shall I not tell you the doors of goodness? And Mu'ad uh, and um, Shall I not tell you the doors of goodness? The Prophet ﷺ said, As-sawmu Jannah. وَالصَّدَقَةُ تُطْفِئُ الْخَطِيئَةِ كَمَا يُطْفِئُ الْمَاءُ النَّارِ وَالصَّلَاةُ الرَّجُلِ فِي جَوْفِ اللَّيْلِ so the Prophet ﷺ said three doors of goodness. He said number one, as salatu as jannah, which is like you're fasting and it's going to protect you. So a person, you know, fasting Mondays, fasting Thursdays, fasting ayamul bid. Ayamul bid are like the 13th, 14th, and 15th of the month of the Hijri calendar, right? Fasting those days. Those are days that are voluntary. Yet you're still fasting. Right? It's voluntary, but you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the sweetest things that you can do is when you pray and when you do something that's voluntary. It's not fard. Obviously, you're doing your fard, and that's the number one thing that will bring you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the fard. And then after that, the voluntary actions. To do more and more and more of those voluntary actions, and you'll come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu said, وَالصَّدَقَةُ تُطْفِئُ الْآمِ that the sadaqa, um, it extinguishes the sin the same way that water extinguishes fire. So we were talking about even the book, when you want your sins like wiped away, you take sadaqa, if you've committed a sin, one of the ways to get it wiped away is through sadaqa. So a person commits a sin, I've committed the sin, Here's $5,000 to the masjid. Here's $5,000 to these orphans. Here's $5,000 this and that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me. And so the person is giving their sadaqah in hopes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would forgive their sins. And the third one that the Prophet sallallahu said, وَالصَّلَاةُ الرَّجُلِ فِي جَوْفِ اللَّيْلِ And the prayer of the man, prayer of, of, of that Muslim, in the middle of the night, jawf is the middle portion. It's interesting, I was, I was talking about like qiyamul layl, and one of the brothers, he told me, he said, doctors say that um, that's when you're in your deepest sleep and it's not good to disturb a person when they're in their deep sleep like that. I said, that be, that's because that, that doctor who told you that is a kafir. <laughs> that's what he's saying, that the worst time to wake up is in the middle of the night. And, Allah, and the Prophet said, this is abwaab al khair, when your body won't let you wake up at that time. Your heart is what wakes you up. Right? And that's why not too many people wake up at that time. Your heart is what's going to wake you up. And then the Prophet ﷺ mentioned uh, the verse of uh, in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعِ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَّا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُنْ جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the Prophet sallallahu after saying this, he, said, he mentioned the verse of the, from the Qur'an, tatajafa, that their limbs forsake their beds of sleep. Junubuhum anil madaja. Why are they abandoning their bed? Why are they abandoning their bed? It's like between me, me and you bed, you know, like forget you. I've forsaken you. Tatajafa <laughs> junubuhum anil And they say this like, subhanAllah, like Imam Nawi rahimahullah, They'll say like how many years that he didn't sleep on a bed. Did he sleep? Yes, he slept. He's a human being. Where did he sleep? On his books. That's where he slept. So this knowledge, remember we were talking about like uh, the Quran and memorizing Quran. We were like, I want to memorize Quran. These scholars wrote volumes and volumes and volumes. It didn't happen through osmosis as we said. They actually did the works and he planted the seeds. Imam Nawi rahimahullah, he used to like, he would work, 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 work until he'd become drowsy. And so he'd actually, he'd fall asleep on the books. His head would go down on the books. He'd sleep. And then he'd wake up from the books. Make wudu, pray, continue studying, continue learning. 
and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was his bed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the characteristics of these people of Jannah that their their limbs forsake their beds. They make dua to Allah khawfan wa tama'a in fear of Allah. So they're making dua. Yes, they have fear. So that's why when we're talking about the verses of hellfire, nobody's you don't come to those verses and try to just avoid it. No, you take it in fear that you might be one of those people. And I would be one of those people. You take it in fear and tama. I love the word tama because it's like what's the what's the translation for tama? Let me see what the guy says here. He said hope. Tama is not hope. Yeah, you could say tama is like in the Arabic, if someone said it, they'd say it, it might almost almost be a derogatory term. Like it's like tama. He's always on, he's so greedy, he wants everything and so on and so forth, all right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising these people that they have tama. They don't want to like, they're not humble. I want to be like the last person in Jannah. I don't mind being at the back or something like that. No, they want the highest level of Jannah. Did we mention this about Umar ibn Abdul Aziz? Did I mention that? Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah, when, um, I think we did. It was the beginning. Didn't I say about the, the cloth? Did I mention it here? I didn't mention it. Okay. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, when he, um, like when he was aspiring to be the Khalifa, aspiring, okay? And I use the words, Umar ibn Aziz, well known. And um, his servant brought him a garment that was like a thousand, you know, it was like a, a thousand dirhams. It was like, it was those, you know, thousand dollar suits or something like that, right? And, and Umar ibn Aziz, he touched the cloth and he said, this cloth is like, it's, it's such cheap quality. And then, later on, his servant brought him a garment. Later on, the Khilafah and so on, he became the Khalifa, brought him a garment that was like, it's like from the dollar store. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he touched it and he said, MashaAllah, it's such soft material. And so this, like, this totally confused the servant. It's totally like, what's going on here? He said, I used to, in the olden days, He's like, I need some explanation here. He goes, I used to bring you like the thousand dollar suits and he used to say that, you know, it's so like cheap quality and, and so like harsh, it's like harsh material. And he goes, now I'm bringing you the cheap stuff the, you know, and you're saying how soft it is. He's like, explain this to me. And so um, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, this has got to go down as probably one of my favorite quotes. I'm telling you, this is like one of my favorite Highest level, favorite quotes. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah, he said to him, he's like, let me explain it to you. He said, Inna li nafsun tawaqa, tatma'u lil ma'ali. He said, I have a soul that is ambitious. It always wants the finer things. I'm like, nice, right? <laughs> Everybody's thinking like, oh, you're not allowed to ha- want the nice things. If you're Muslim, you got to aim low. <laughs> and that's what the, like, the, the people are going around saying that you have to aim low. This is Umar ibn Abdul Aziz saying like, I have an ambitious soul that does not settle for anything but the best. Okay? And then he said, not only that, he's like, but even power and position. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he said, every time I got a position, I'm not satisfied. I want more than this. It's like, so he becomes like a general, it's not good enough. I'm general, I have like, you know, 500,000 people listening to me, who cares? I want the next position up. And you know, maybe minister, I don't, he gets the minister, I don't want that. I want the khilafa. I'm the khalifa. So I remember Abdul Aziz, he had the ambition to be the khalifa and he became the khalifa. And so he's telling his servant, he's like, I always want, he's like, every time I, I reached a position, I always wanted the higher position. I always wanted more power. Interesting points here. You're thinking like, oh, this is, goes against kind of like what we're learning, right? That's why I say it's one of my favorite quotes. Then he said that until I got to the point where I reached the Khilafah. The Khalifa is the highest position in the Islamic Empire. There is no position higher than the Khalifa. He said, when I went to the Khalifa position, I still wasn't satisfied. We're talking about dunya, right? Every time they get something, they still want more. And now he's in the Khalifa, uh, khalifa position. And he has all the money that he wants And he has all the power that he wants There is no power position higher than the Khalifa And he, there's no money that he doesn't That you know he needs more money He said but he's still ambitious 
So then, at that point, he's saying to his servant, I realize that there is a higher position than Khalifa. And that is Jannatul Firdaus. And he said, now my heart wants it. And that's why he's changed. That's Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, with a, as they mentioned, like the fifth of the Khulafa al-Rashidin. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz had an ambitious heart. And so, as everybody else tells you to aim low, I'm telling you to be ambitious. And don't settle for anything less than Jannatul Firdaus. Obviously, Jannatul Firdaus has its seeds. Has its seeds. You will find this in Surah Al-Mu'minun. Its seeds. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنَ اللَّهُ مُعْرِضُونَ well, All these verses explaining Surah Al-Mu'minun, look it up. I believe it's Surah 18. And you will find there, it's about the first 11 verses, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ They are the inheritors. الَّذِينَ يَرِثُونَ الْفِرْدَوْسَ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ They will inherit Firdaus هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Remember I told you about Asiya alayhi salam? And I said that there was, I thought about why. I kept bringing up that story again and again. I thought about it and I think I know why. Asiya had the riches of the dunya in this life, with being the wife of Fir'aun. You imagine like, does she have any, um, you know, is there any end to the servants that are at her beck and call? No. Does she, where is she living? You want to live in a big house in Canada and stuff like that? Where did Asiya live? She lived in the home of Fir'aun. Even someone flies over like Egypt and they're like, I could see the home of Fir'aun, the pyramids. <laughs> that's his graveyard, that's not his home. Right, that's the, like the tombstone. Even till today, you can still see it. You're flying up there, you can still see it. Asiya lived there. She had all the servants that she wanted. She had anything that the dunya, everything, it belonged to her there. And yet, with all that, she still believed in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Even though it meant that she would sacrifice all of that. So when you think that you have to sacrifice anything, you haven't sacrificed Jack. You haven't sacrificed anything. You just go back and look at Asya alayhi salam. Someone will say, oh, I became Muslim and now my parents won't invite me for dinner. What have you sacrificed? You have examples in those that came before you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left them as an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is about speaking about paradise, speaking about hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا قَبْلَهُمْ مِنْ قَرْنٍ هُمْ أَشَدُّ مِنْهُمْ بَطُشًا فَنَقَّبُوا فِي الْبِلَادِ هَلْ مِنْ مَحِيصٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَمْ How many nations have we destroyed? Right? And we did the other series on parish nations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed nation after nation in their disbelief in Allah after all the messengers came to them. Allah destroyed them. How many were destroyed? هُمْ أَشَدُّ مِنْهُمْ They have more power. Any power that you could ever accumulate, the nations that were destroyed had more power than you. They accumulated more wealth than you had. They were more intelligent than you were. And yet they disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah destroyed them. فَنَقَّبُوا فِي الْبِلَادِ هَلْ مِنْ and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this verse, all these verses, it's a beautiful ending to this, all that we're talking about. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَذِكْرَى لِمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ قَلْبٍ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَذِكْرَى لِمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ قَلْبٌ أَوْ أَلْقَى السَّمْعَ وَهُوَ شَهِيدٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna fi dhalika la dhikra. That in all of this is a reminder. A reminder for whom? Liman kana lahu qal. For those who have hearts. Aw alqa sama. Or for those who put forth their ear to listen. Wa huwa shaheed. And they testify and they're witness. I said that that was the end, right? It's not. This hadith has got to go down is one of my absolute favorite hadith. 
And subhanAllah, you know, um, in every story, you're always hoping for a happy ending, correct? This hadith, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it the end of your story. And I'm saying this to you in hopes that the angels will say Amin and to you be the same. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا دَخَلَ أَهْلُ الْجَنَّةِ الْجَنَّةِ When the people of Jannah will enter Jannah, and the affair is over, the people of Jannah have entered Jannah. قَالَ يَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى تُرِيدُونَ شَيْئًا أَزِيدُكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the people of Jannah, Is there anything else that I can give you more? That's it. This is Jannah. They have everything. Is there anything more? After all of that, nothing that you could imagine, you have all of that. No death, no sickness, all of the things in Jannah, everything that we've been speaking about. Fayaqulun. So the people of Jannah will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Alam tu wujuhana. Didn't you illuminate our faces? Alam tu jannah. Didn't you enter us into jannah? So they're not even asking for anything more. They're like, we have everything. Didn't you enter us into jannah? What to najina min nar and save us from hellfire? What more could we ask for? And I hope, inshallah ta'ala, on this day, that you will be with your family and all your loved ones. And on the moment when this happens, when everybody's saying this, as the hadith continues, فَيَكْشِفُ hijab, That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will unveil himself to Ahl al-Jannah. And Ahl al-Jannah will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَمَا أُعْطُوا شَيْئًا أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّظَرِ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ عَزَّ وَجَلْ That there is nothing in Jannah Nothing that is better than seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This will be the greatest mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the people of Jannah is that they will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, recited the verse, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا الْحُسْنَى وَزِيَادَةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the verse of Allah, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا For those who did ihsan, they lived their life with ihsan and they did righteous deed, to them is righteousness. To them is greatness and goodness waziyada and extra. And that extra, as the Prophet ﷺ explained it, is seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. Jazakumullahu khayran. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me if I made any mistakes in this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from me uh, the best of what was said. Uh, like I um, mentioned earlier that um, the notes that I have with me, all the verses, the ayah numbers, the Arabic for it, the English, inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow I'm going to be um, distributing this on the internet. Um, so if you want to receive a copy of the notes and if you'd like um, a copy of the video, Insha'Allah Ta'ala, we're going to be um, uploading the video and we're going to be sharing the notes. So to get this, you need to go, if you want to write down the website, the website is successinislam.com, successinislam.com, and indeed your success is only in Islam. Right? Successinislam.com, it's a mailing list, just put your um, name and your email address, and Insha'Allah Ta'ala, you'll start receiving messages from me um, weekly, Insha'Allah Ta'ala, plus I'll be sending this out tomorrow. وجزاكم الله خيرا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك السلام عليكم